Hello everyone, welcome to Digital Signal Processing using Scilab. So what is Scilab? Scilab is an open source alternative to MATLAB and it can be pretty handful for implementing all the DSP algorithms. So the Scilab can be easily downloaded by going to their website and you can download either 32-bit or 64-bit depending on the configuration of your PC. So the installation after that is straightforward. So you can just set it up and now we can get started with our DSP lab. So for program one, what we have is we are going to see how we can plot your basic signals in Scilab. So we are going to use impulse, step, ramp, exponential and sinusoidal signals and we are going to see how to plot these five basic signals using your Scilab program. So the first line that we are going to see is Y1. So Y1 is my output signal or Y1 is my signal 1 that is going to be my impulse or delta signal. So we all know that your impulse signal is valid, has value at only one instant of time. So here what I'm doing is my line one is defining my Y1, which is zeros between one to 21. So I am defining around 20 zeros. That is the zero command is gonna generate 20 zeros of the dimension one row and column is 21. So that is what a zero command does. So for example, if I am doing zeros of one comma five, I'm going to see something like this. It generates a zero array of size one row and five column. Now I can do a two dimensional matrix also with my zero command. So let us say another example where I'm going to initialize zero of two comma three. So that is going to give me a 2D matrix which is of uh, dimension two row three column. So this is uh, the use of zeros function and it can be very helpful for initializing a lot of variables in the beginning of your program. So here we are initializing a signal which is having all zeros which is having around 21 zeros and it is going to have a single value one which is going to be my 11th value. So the middle of my signal is going to have a value one and that is going to look like my delta signal. That's going to be my delta signal. Good. And the de delta signal is plotted using your subplot command. So a subplot in Scilab allows you to plot multiple graphs on the same window. Right. So the syntax of your subplot is subplot. The first argument is the rows. Second argument is the columns and the third argument is count. So when I say row, I'm talking about the horizontal positioning. And when I'm talking about column, I'm talking about the vertical positioning. Good. So this is uh, the subplot is what we are using for this program. So we are going to see three to one means I'm going to have three rows, two columns. So three comma two is the size of my display which means I'm gonna, I can fit in six graphs. I can fit in six graphs in this subplot, which says subplot of three comma two comma one. Good, so that count can vary from one to six. So let us see how we are gonna show six graphs in this window. Now what you see here is your impulse signal that we just generated. The next signal that we are gonna do is your step signal. So for step signal, you know what we are going to do is we are going to initialize a signal Y2 with all zeros. And then we are going to make some of the values one, not just a single value. So in case of the step signal, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the second half of my signal as one. And I'm going to do that using my colon operator. The colon operator in Scilab operates from two with step increment. So one to 10 means I'm getting one, three, five, seven, nine. It says that it is from one to 10 with increments of two. 
So here, what I'm going to do for my step signal is I'm going to make my second half of the signal as one. That is, I'm going to make all the values from 11 to 21 as one, and then I'm going to plot it. And this time, I'm going to plot it at 3, 2, 2. So 3, 2 represents my 3, row, 2 column graph. And the position now is 2. So it's going to be the second position of my graph. So let us see the second graph, how it looks like. Good. And I will also do the ramp signal simultaneously because ramp is just a simple call and operator. I'm just putting it as 1 to 10 and that gives me my ramp signal. Good. So I have now my impulse, my step and my ramp. Now I'm going to do the exponential increasing far signal an exponentially decreasing signal and my sinusoidal signal. So you can see here for exponentially increasing signal for exponential and sinusoidal signal, I'm going to use the range from zero to two pi in increments in step size of pi by 100 using my colon operator. So if you see within the brackets after exponential, you see zero to two pi, the increment is 2 star pi divided by 100 and that function when plotted using the subplot is going to give you an increasing and a decreasing exponential. The next is my sinusoid and for my sinusoid signal I am going to use the same 0 to 2 pi with intervals of 2 pi by 100. So the step size here is 2 pi by 100 and when I plot my graph I am going to see something like this. So here if you see when I change it from 0 to 2 pi I get one cycle when I change it from 0 to 4 pi I get two cycles and when I change it from 0 to 8 pi I get four cycles so on. So that is the number of cycles that you get in your sinusoid. I can also replace the sine with cos and I will get a cosine signal. So this is now my four cycle cost. So it can be a sinusoidal signal can be either sine or a cost signal. Good, so that is about your program one. Now let us see a program two. So your program two is CT and DT signals which says continuous time and discrete time signal. So we are gonna plot a CT signal and then we are going to plot a DT signal and in order to plot CT signal we will be using this formula x of t is equal to cos omega of t where my omega is given by 2 pi f t. So here we assume my amplitude is 1. So else we would have something like amplitude into cos 2 pi f t. Good. So in order to implement this continuous time signal as you can see, I need my frequency, so which I'm going to define it as f is equal to 60. And now I also need my time axis, t. So the time axis, is it, it must have multiple values because it is my integral. My t is my integral in my continuous time signal. So it should have a lower limit, a t minima and a t maxima, which is given by t minimum to 2 maximum. And now, I need a lot of points. I need a uh, plenty of points to make this signal continuous in my time axis. And to generate a lot of points, I am going to use a scilab function called as linear spaced values. So the lin space, what it does is, in this case, between 0 to 1, it generates 10 equispace points as closely, you know, as equal space points as it can between 0 to 1. If I do 0, 1, 20, then it generates 20 equispace points. So in our program, so between t minima and t maximum, between time minimum and time maximum, we are going to generate 400 points just so that this signal is a continuous signal. Good. You can keep it 1000, you can keep it 2000, you can keep any higher number that is computationally possible by Scilab to plot your continuous time signal. 
So we think uh, 400 to 500 is a good number to keep and you need to use your linear space function, lint space, to extract time points between t minimum and t maximum. Good. Now I'm going to implement this equation. I'm going to put this t and f in my cos. So I'm going to take cos of 2 pi f t and then I'm going to plot this graph and you can see I have my continuous time signal which starts from minus 0.5 to 0.05. Excellent. Good. So now let us do our discrete time signal. So the discrete time signal that I'm going to plot is taken right out of our lecture. So we are going to see for discrete time we need sampling, right? We need to do sampling and the sampling algorithm that we have seen in our uh, lecture is xc of t is equal to xc of n, t is, is equal to xc of n. So this is the block diagram that we have seen in lecture 2. And now if you say, you know, if uh, what I'm going to do is to do this sampling or to do this discrete time plot, I need my sampling frequency or my sampling period which is taken as t is, is equal to 1 by 600. And then I am calculating my sampling minimum and sampling maximum which can be got from this equation of xc of t minimum is equal to x of n min t s. You can see my n min is obtained by t min by t s and my n max is taken as t max by t s. And now I plot my discrete time signal where my t is equivalent is n t s. So you can see from the equation your xc of t is equal to xc of n t s. So that is used in your discrete signal good so now the f here is your signal frequency so what it means is you're sampling your ct signal with the frequency of 60 using sampling frequency which is 600 so now the discrete signal this is what you see is your sampling the sampling theorem or this just the sampling that we have seen is represented here good now let's move to program 3. So in the program 3 we are going to see aliasing in time domain. So aliasing in time axis. So we have seen this also in class. The aliasing in time axis causes two things. It alters the frequency of the signal. It distorts the shape of the signal. So we are going to see how that's going to happen. We are going to use the same program that we have seen. The program 2 we are using just the program 2 here except that I am going to change my sampling frequency. So previously my sampling frequency was 600 and as per the Nyquist theorem or the sampling theorem my fs should be greater than 2 fn which means my sampling frequency 600 must be greater than 2 star 60 my signal frequency and that is true because 600 is greater than 120 so which leads to no aliasing. So now in this case, what I'm going to do in program three is I am going to bring down my sampling frequency. I'm going to reduce my sampling frequency to just say a small value like 70. And then let us see how my discrete signal looks like or how my discrete signal plots out to be. Good. So now when I plot this graph, you can see very clearly the aliasing effect. The frequency of the signal has changed. My original signal is having around six cycles. Yes, but in my aliased signal or in my signal with small sampling frequency, I have just one cycle or even less than one cycle. And the second is the shape of the signal. So now I have changed the frequency to 100. So when I do 100, the shape is different. Even when I take 300, you can see it 300 is greater than 120 but still the shape is not very accurate so that is because there is no interpolation. It's just, just let's say by using 600 we get a very good estimate so here we need to use fs greater than 2fn so we are able to see how aliasing is happening in your time axis now the fourth program or the last program for today's class is 
your aliasing in frequency spectrum or spectral overlap good so the spectral overlap can be shown using convolution in frequency domain right because it's a multi so but um, uh, we, we are going to see a much simpler approach because uh, when we go on um, you know as we progress in this lab i'll bring the convolution programs and i'll show you how it can be done with the help of convolution but for now i'm going to just do a simple spectral uh, program which is based on again your sample numbers so in this case what i'm going to do is i am using a conditional statement here and my conditional statement is having a step size for i is equal to 1 is to step size is to 124 and that 1 is to step size is to 124 represents my number of samples so basically this program if you look very closely it is not too difficult if your x signal is ranging from 1 to 1200 and you're plugging in your y from 450 to 450 plus 124 so now if i plot the signal so let me say i am after after taking the sinusoid i am calculating the frequency spectrum using my fft command the abs gives the magnitude of the command so now when i plot the signal i am seeing for sample points equal to 120 so the sample point equal to 120 i am getting a frequency spectrum now I'm going to reduce the sample points. So how do I do that? I increase the step size. When I increase the step size, my sample points is reduced to just 40. And then when I do it for 40 sample points, you see a lot more spectrum. The spectrum are more closely, more close to one another. Then I am again reducing the number of sample points. I am making this as 10. So by reducing the number of sample points, what we are doing is we are reducing your sampling frequency. So when I reduce the sampling point again to 10, what happens is your number of sample points is just 10 and you see now there is overlap. So now the frequency spectrum is overlapping. You can start to see overlap in your this thing. And now I am going to further increase. So now this frequency is 12. So let me again increase the reduce the sample point or increase the step size to say 20 and then your number of samples is now just six and you will definitely see a big time overlap so we are going to see a you know, big big overlap here you can see how your overlap spectrum looks like so this is your aliasing in spectral domain right you are having aliasing or your spectral overlap good so i hope the programs of uh, today's are is clear so this program will make sense if you have followed the class lectures because they have been written after the class lectures